So it's a, it's a small world, isn't it? And so is Dublin. You see, <clears throat> uh, in Dublin, Willie was friends with Bram Stoker. When Oscar was um, studying the English scene, the philosophers, the painters, the poets, um, he, uh, he heard too late from Willie that Bram Stoker, this uh, obscure civil servant, had given a lecture on Dante Gabriel Rossetti's poetry in Dublin. Well, I would like to have caught that. So yeah, Willie and Bram are friends. But in, in Dublin also, Wilde, always partial to beauty, he, he, he never, he was never a lech, but he always, uh, he sought out beautiful women. He would give them flowers, he would, he would uh, pay them amazing compliments and uh, charm them. And so on. One of these women was Florence, Florence Balcom, a beautiful Dublin woman. Uh, and he, he even gave her a ring, a kind of token of, not an engagement ring as such, but a kind of token of more to come. But of course, Oscar was, was back in London, wasn't he, and back in Oxford too regularly. And so Bram Stoker then stepped into the fray and ended up marrying um, Florence Balcom. So you see this uh, very small world here. Wilde actually discreetly asked Florence for the token back, which was, <laughs> it was quite a stylish and expensive token, so it was only right that she return it. Um, Bram wouldn't have been happy either. So uh, he, he, and there were dejected poems about this. When he got back to London, Lily Langtry, Alan Terry, all his PBs would be regaled with the tragic tale of how how Oscar lost the love of his life to uh, a civil servant in Dublin. <laughs> but pretty quickly, actually, Bram and Florence Balcom followed Oscar to London and installed themselves there. Why? It's because <clears throat> um, Bram Stoker's critical uh, acumen had become noticed. He was beginning to review plays and things like that in Dublin. And one thing led to another. He was offered a job as a kind of uh, manager of the Lyceum Theatre, as well as being a personal assistant to the, 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 the Olivier of the age, uh, the actor Henry Irving. So Bram suddenly had this very, very good job at a great theatre in London, working for a great actor. There's a little poem here I want to tell you about. Um, one of the amazing lines in, in the novel Dracula is uh, a line that maybe we can think of today, the dead travel fast. Anyone remember that line? <laughs> the dead travel fast. But it's a variant of a line from an 18th century German poem by Gottfried Burger, some of you might know. Den der Toten Rieten Schnell is, is the German. For the dead ride, the dead ride fast, for the dead gallop fast. So Bram Stoker seems to have taken this great line of uh, German poetry and just sort of simplified it. The dead travel fast. Uh, and critics have gone into looking at the line and its evolution from German literature into English literature. Apparently Dante Gabriel Rossetti did a little take on the line before Bram Stoker. So Bram perhaps hadn't gone to the German, he'd taken it from Dante Gabriel Rossetti. But I myself, in the research for this walk, have made a crucial discovery. I shall be writing to Bruce Stewart, the uh, the literary professor at uh, the Ulster University in Coleraine, whose essay I read and enjoyed, but he didn't spot what I just spotted the other day, looking at an Oscar Wilde poem. So let me try and find it. Um, so uh, Wilde visiting Lyceum Theatre to homage Henry Irving. Um, and he writes a sonnet. Wilde often wrote sonnets. Uh, this is called Fabienne de Franchi to my friend Henry Irving. The silent room, the heavy creeping shade, the dead that travel fast, the opening door, the murdered brother rising through the floor, the ghost's white fingers on thy shoulders laid, 
And then the lonely duel in the glade, the broken swords, the stifled scream, the gore. Thy grand, revengeful eyes when all is o'er, these things are well enough. But thou wert made for more august creation, frenzied Lear. Should at thy bidding wander on the heath with the shrill fool to mock him, Romeo, for thee should lure his love and desperate fear pluck Richard's recreant dagger from its sheath. Thou, trumpet set, for Shakespeare's lips to blow. So it's kind of wild, slightly highfalutin, saying to Henry Irving, enough of this gothic, enough of this gothic rubbish. Do something great. Do some Shakespeare. Uh, perhaps that was a put-down to Bram Stoker, because Bram did get a rehearsed reading of an adaption for theatrical idea of Dracula put on at the Lyceum Theatre. Henry Irving watched, and, uh, and Henry's verdict was, Similar to Wilde's, obviously. This is absolute rubbish, Bram. <laughs> absolute rubbish. Give up this idea of writing completely. Just concentrate your energies on working for me and the Lyceum. It's one of the most ignorant put-downs in the whole history of, uh, of dramaturgy because Henry Irving just failed to see the future. Dracula, the success of Dracula, and the thousand and one theatrical and cinematic adaptions. Henry Irving, to me, that was one of the cruelest things he ever did to, uh, to, to, to poor old Bram Stoker, eh?